Hi, my name is Caro. I am a PSL organizer. I've been in the PSL for five years now. Um, and I'm currently a volunteer for the Claudia Karina campaign. And in my five years in the party, I have learned a lot from these two women, but also from many of the comrades in our party. I've engaged in campaigns that have fought gentrification. Um, I'm a Queens, New Yorker native, so um, that's very important to me. I've been a part of uh, anti-police brutality and false incarceration um, campaigns. And I've also been a part of COVID-19 mutual aid projects, as well as participating in the huge mobilizations that have been happening around the country for Palestine in the last few months. So today we're in conversation with Claudia and Karina, who are uh, vying for president and vice president of the United States of America under our party, our ballot line, Party for Socialism and Liberation. So I'm gonna like, give them a little second to introduce themselves. I'm sure there's not much intro introduction needed. Hi, my name is Claudia de la Cruz and I am running for president of these United States of America <laughs> <laughs> under the ballot of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm an organizer, I'm a mom, a theologian. I've been organizing for close to 30 years um, around many issues that impact our working class people and I'm just happy to be here. Hi, my name is Karina Garcia. I'm a member of the New York City branch of the PSL and the vice president of these United States of America, <laughs> the candidate, <laughs> not the vice president yet. Um, and yeah, I've um, been organizing since I was a teenager um, and I joined the party when I was 20. Amazing. So I'm super honored to have, you know, the privilege to talk to you all today. Um, I wanted to ask as a first question, so when I read you guys' bio um, on your campaign, on any campaign literature, anything that we're distributing, it says one of the first things is that you guys are mothers. You guys are working class mothers. So I, wanna, I want you guys to touch on what that means, what being a mother means uh, in relation to running in this election and being an organizer. I think, I mean, I joined the party when I was 20 years old and I was not a mother. I was a student organizer. And, um, you know, the organizing, the movement that I'm a part of, that we're all a part of, is a movement that actually has to transform society. And so um, it is a life project. Um, so throughout my kind of growth, <laughs> um, I've had different jobs and 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 I became a mom too and I'm my political work is not going to stop because I became a mom it's a lot more difficult <laughs> I'll give I'll say that but um but it's important I mean I had I had my son when I was 34 years old mm -hmm. which some people make my mom consider that to be pretty late in the game but not me um <laughs> I had started doing organizing work at 13. There was um, a lot of responsibilities that came with that. Mm -hmm. And having my child was also a political decision for me. Mm -hmm. um, prior to like accepting motherhood as something that I wanted to do, I read Asada's autobiography. Because mm -hmm. for a long time I said I didn't want to be a mother mm -hmm. in the society in which we exist. <laughs> because it's just complete chaos. Because it doesn't provide what's necessary for families to have kids and it doesn't support children in becoming and developing mm -hmm. adults that are you know contributing to society in the best way possible so i i understood yeah. that it was so chaotic i didn't want to have a kid mm -hmm. and then i read asada's autobiography and she understood that her having a child was a contribution to the revolution <laughs> mm -hmm. um and my approach to to birthing my my son at 34 was precisely, I want to be able to give life, but not only life to occupy space in this world, but to contribute to a revolution. Mm -hmm. And the only way of doing that was integrating him into the organizing work that I was doing. And so I, I approached motherhood as a responsibility mm -hmm. and a contribution to society. And so I am very uh, cautious of an intentional of integrating him mm -hmm. in the spaces that I'm in that I'm in mm -hmm. um whether they be meetings whether they be rallies um I think it's highly important for our children to be able to learn I mean the only if you're a teacher if you're engaging with young mm -hmm. people you know 
that they learn not by what you say, but by what you do. They right. learn as a pedagogy of example. You exemplify right. what you want them to be. They're paying attention. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, he'll grow up to be whatever he wants to be. What I do not want him to be is someone that sucks the life out of others. <laughs> and that is what capitalists do. Mm -hmm. And so what I would want him to be is someone that contributes in a positive way to any space that he's in. Right. And it's particularly important for me because he's a boy. Mm. In a I was going to say raising a son. Yeah, in a society that tells women, you know, who have girls, take care of your girls, you know, as if... We don't have to teach our sons how to behave in this world mm -hmm. um, and how to be anti-patriarchal and mm -hmm. how to be, you know, just human. And so mm -hmm. I think that there's a, a, a level of responsibility that I that I consciously took on and, and that I understand is um, is necessary for us to have when we have children, that we are facilitating, that we're teaching, mm -hmm. that we're introducing, that we're exposing. And we need to be really intentional about what it is that we want to do and what type of life project do we want to be able to yeah. hand over to them to continue. Um, and in the sense of the campaign, like I, oh, I often think about Mandela. Mandela would say that you could see what the soul of a nation is by the way that it prioritizes its children. Mm -hmm. And we live in a society in which Children are food, in, food insecure, mm -hmm. where there's increasing numbers of homelessness, mm -hmm. where parents are losing their jobs and therefore losing their health care. There's at least two million children who lost access to health insurance mm -hmm. just last year. And so we're talking mm -hmm. about a society that does not prioritize children. In fact, it utilizes children in so many different ways to to kind of force parents to have to engage in a system that's destructive to them and their children. Mm -hmm. And so I think for for us, for me, um, doing this campaign, taking on the challenge is, is also part of that responsibility towards my child mm. and towards the millions of children in this country who deserve a better shot in, in this world. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I don't know if Karina, you want to add on to that. <clears throat> well, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, I it's kind of similar to Claudia, actually. I had my daughter when I was 33, mm -hmm. and it really took a long time to, I kept, it's late for my family, <laughs> late. <laughs> Everybody was like for a decade or yeah. more. Come on, Karina, what's going on? And, um, and you know, so, it, but I didn't feel ready. It took a really long time to me, for me to feel ready, and I think, that's the case for a lot of women in this country, that that they feel like there is, what is there? You know, you're so in my in my case, you know, you're like looking at your student debt. You know, you're looking at the cost of living. You're thinking about just there's so much. There's so and the more political you are, <laughs> the more yeah. you know you're how you how the really? system is. Yeah. You're you're so aware of. Yeah how terrible the ruling class is when it comes to families and working class people. And so you don't really feel like you want to necessarily bring someone into that. Yeah. So I think it took a long time for me to feel like confident that I can do it. And for me, I think it also helped me seeing a lot of other women and reminding myself who I am and my family, my people, you know, like, hell yeah, I should be able to have a family. Why not? Why can't we have a family in this country? And it gives you more of a reason to fight, you know, because there's no reason why our people should be needlessly suffering mm -hmm. these yeah. these these humiliations, really. But also remembering, man, our people are strong, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and my family did it and my tias did it and my, you know, every they all do it in difficult circumstances and they manage and mm -hmm. I'm them too. Mm -hmm. I can manage. I can do it. Mm -hmm. So I think it took a lot of kind of confidence but it took it from not just from myself i think it's from being with other women being with other moms we're the working working class women mm -hmm. because working class women are the ones who feel all of the problems in society they're completely undervalued they're completely underappreciated and yet they continue right. by some miracle mm -hmm. they find a way right. and they fight for themselves and they fight for their families they may not speak english they may be getting their wages stolen but they come together and they find a way and I just had to kind of find that 
strength that I have in me too, then I'm going to find a way. And God damn it, if I want to have a family, I'm going to have a family. <laughs> and if you want to run in an election, you run in an election. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think speaking for myself, like I am 29, you know, my parents are on me about my birthing years too. But it, it's, I think myself, like, if I wanted to have kids, I'm I'm really paralyzed, like you said, by this system because mm -hmm. I know it does not prioritize life. I know it's it's not going to take care of me in my life planning if that's part of my journey mm -hmm. is to have a, a child. Um, but I think actually the more of a socialist I become and the more I'm, I, I kind of am, like, cultivating hope day by day, the more I'm, like, I, you know, there's... You just got to do it. And yeah. Woman, you just, <laughs> no, or like if that's something that you really want, you just got to do it. And then there's women that, that have done it in, in like extreme conditions. Mm -hmm. um, extreme conditions of poverty, extreme conditions of, of violence mm -hmm. and war. Um, one of the women that had a really huge impact in my life, whose testimony I heard at 14 was Nievesitis. And I always speak about her because she's a... Chilean exile who went through three years of torture in one of the worst prisons in Chile mm -hmm. after the coup mm -hmm. of 1973. And one of the things that she shared with, with people and continues to share in terms of her history, and in a very strong and like resilient way, she says it, is the way in which they tortured her. Um, and basically managed to destroy her entire reproductive system mm -hmm. in Chile. Wow. And it was not until she was able to go to Cuba and the Cuban doctors basically saved her in a way that she was able to bear one child, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it had, if it hadn't been for the Cuban doctors, she wouldn't have been able to to bear that one child that she that she has and now she has a granddaughter and mm -hmm. but but the decision of having a child after enduring the most extreme of tortures mm -hmm. to me it is it it just exemplifies a level of force of our people to exist like mm -hmm. the the determination of our people to exist is there and like you were saying like there's a level of strength that we draw from those stories mm -hmm. um one of the ways in which you know and and they were idf trained soldiers in chile because that's mm -hmm. also good to bring that that you know it was the same folks that are doing that genocidal extermination campaign in palestinian land those same israeli forces were the ones who trained the wow. dictatorship mm -hmm. in chile to do that level of torturing. And when you see that level of resilience, when you see that level of strength, then you're like, the question becomes, how am I not gonna have that strength? Like, mm -hmm. if they did that then, then what am I complaining about? Mm -hmm. Then you have to show up. And mm -hmm. when they were torturing these women, a lot of the things that they would say is, I'm gonna cut the possibility of you birthing another red child, a, a mm. red person, another communist. No more communist. Wow. And she bore that child, and she had that child conscious that that child was gonna be that. Mm. That was like the ultimate f you mm -hmm. to the to the yeah, you know? <laughs> you know. And so I think we need to draw strength from those histories, from our mm. mothers, our grandmothers, our tias, and if we choose, and we choose not to have kids we engage in life projects yeah. that are that are producing yeah you know sustainability that needs life to be an option yeah that needs to be an option to participate in the overall social reproduction of our That's society right. to make sure like because i'm i'm an educator so for me i i am around children i am a, around younger people than me and to and i feel so invested into cultivating you know, people and to getting to know them and to really, um, you know, see them as people that have I have ideas, have um, want want to learn and want to be skilled and want to be, um, you know, integrated and, and want to help mm -hmm. society move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I love that you say that because it's so true. You know, we should never um, the right does a lot of things to 
sort of dehumanize people. Mm -hmm. And and it sort of holds up motherhood as if that's the only way to be a woman, as mm -hmm. if mom as if women can't be many things. And mm -hmm. there's plenty of women who don't want to have kids and that's fine. They're making and they can make contribute to the movement in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be this divide where, you know, some are so I always appreciate that about the party and about the spaces that we come from, the respect mm -hmm. um, for people's different paths and mm -hmm. that they're all valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I speaking of paths, I really want to learn more about Yale's personal journeys, what shaped you into becoming the socialist woman that you are today. How did you come into socialism? I mean, we, we don't come out the womb and very few of us are born into families, <laughs> like knowing, uh, like what's it, what, no, knowing how to think like a socialist, right? And to see society as capable of change, um, specifically by the working class people. So how did you, how did you come to that? <laughs> well, I think, you know, socialism, I'm going to say this, and it might not be a popular opinion. <laughs> I think socialism is somewhat innate to people. And somewhat normal to working mm -hmm. class people because if you're poor, I, I grew up. Um, I mean, like a capital S socialist, by the way. You know, yeah, but no, no, yeah, no. I but, think but, as people. But, but let me start there, and then I'll move up to the big, mm -hmm. the capital S. <laughs> um, I think the reason that I'm saying is kind of innate is because it asks the right questions. Like, mm -hmm. if you're a working class person, if you're a poor person, there is a moment in time in which you ask why, mm -hmm. like. Why am I living in the conditions that I'm living in? And that is a Marxist question. The why is always a Marxist question. Mm -hmm. It might not necessarily draw us to like the same conclusions, right? Um, but if you're serious about finding out why, you're gonna explore the different factors in society that make you poor mm -hmm. and that make you working class. And so when I say that it's innate, is because we ask, in a lot of ways, the questions that come from our gut, from mm -hmm. our very need of having to survive in this system that is not built for us. And so when I came into organizing, I did not come to organizing um, as a socialist or with mm -hmm. a socialist mentality, but it was definitely along the lines of socialism because I understood that it wasn't something that was wrong with me. <laughs> There's something wrong that is systemic and is structural because not only do I live in these conditions, but the majority of people in my community live in these conditions. And they might not speak it in the same way. Mm -hmm. They might not express it in the same way. They might not even articulate things in the same way, but we're all suffering. Yeah. And so I was born and raised in the Bronx. I lived in the Dominican Republic for a good chunk of my life. My grandmother, who was caring for us, um, survived the dictatorship that was imposed by the United States in the Dominican Republic. She had an understanding of what it meant to be a black woman under a dictatorship that was imposed by the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so she understood that government administrations in the United States were not necessarily friends of the Caribbean. And so by default, mm -hmm. <laughs> she was very drawn to like Cuba. She didn't know right. what about it. She knew it was different. She knew that there was a different leader that was Fidel Castro. And she was okay with him because he was not friends to U.S. empire, mm -hmm. which was ultimately the reason why she had to survive a dictatorship mm -hmm. as a black woman. And so when, when I came back to the United States after having lived there, we moved right back to the community that I was born into. Um, high levels of poverty, high levels of drug use. Um, you know, I have two brothers. So in, inside my house, I'm dealing with issues of patriarchy. So I'm the only girl. I have to clean after these two <laughs> grown ass kids. Uh, you know, I Tell have to. This time. Yeah, I have to tend to my dad. You know, my dad gets home from work, and my mom's like, "Go get his slippers." Right. You know, and it's like, why do I have to do this? You know, why do I have to be the one to do this? And um, my grandmother was really good at challenging all of that. She would like basically defend me. And, mm -hmm. and say things like, but they have hands and they have feet and they can do things <laughs> on their own. And she would say things like, if you like to eat, you need to learn how to cook. Mm. And so she made it a, her business to teach my brothers how to feed Good. themselves, you know. Good. But but it was like that contradiction and those dynamics in my household where, where you could see that 
my mom was more on the conservative side. My grandmother, because of her own experiences, was was very much like, mm-hmm. we need to protect you at all costs because these people are going to drive you crazy. <laughs> And I was raising a lot of questions. My mom, ultimately, you know, she was an educator. She's very objective. Um, so she tries to respond, respond to questions as factually as possible mm-hmm. with history. And there were questions she couldn't, she couldn't answer. There were questions she couldn't articulate mm-hmm. a, a, a reason for why, you know, mm-hmm. especially in the United States, like the question of race, like she was like, I just don't know. I know the question of race in the Dominican Republic and mm-hmm. how it connects to like imperialism and U.S. colonial. Like, I don't know the history here. I don't know, you know, what what causes the conditions in which we are, where there's like high levels of drug addictions and drug use. And, and so she like, identified a church for me to go to at 13. Mm. And it was like a hive of communists. <laughs> your That's grandmother why, my, found you that church? <laughs> my mom. Oh, your my mom. Because she didn't know the answers to a lot of the questions. But one of her teachers um, at Hostos Community College was a psychiatrist and mm-hmm. was an independentista. He was a Puerto Rican independentista, um, socialist, and was a leader of the church. And my mom said, maybe you could answer the questions. And so I, mm. I started attending the church. And I didn't realize it at 13, I guess. But a lot of the folks there were either coming from the, you know, fleeing the Civil War in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Some of them were members of the FMLN in El Salvador. Mm. There were folks who were organizing uh, what they called Circulos Bolivarianos or Bolivarian Circles. This was pre the election of Chavez. (laughs) (laughs) And so they were organizing the Venezuelan communities here to be able to, you know, get Chavez elected, mm. kind of like deepen the consciousness of people around mm-hmm. uh, the Valerian revolution. And I mean, I was basically just surrounded by by folks that had a socialist and, and, and communist ideology who had been part of movements in mm. Latin America, the Caribbean, and folks who had been part of struggle here. Mm-hmm. So one of the first campaigns that I worked in was... Um, around the freedom of the uh, Puerto Rican political prisoners Mm -hmm. in the 1990s, which some of them were given pardon by Clinton, given, right? We won that, but they said that they gave pardons to the political prisoners in 1999. Um, This is where, you know, Andres and um, Oscar Lopez say, we're not going to, we don't want pardon, we're going to stay. So out of a group, 12 of them were released and two were the, two of them were kept back. So that was the first campaign that I worked in. I worked doing like street, um, doing organizing with street organizations, what is mm-hmm. called gangs. People mm. call gangs. We call them street organizations. We were the Latin kings and the nietas. Very, very conscious. Yeah. And so very the idea too. was to like politicize the leadership so that they could um, be integrated and doing movement work. A lot of them participated in anti-police brutality work. Mm-hmm. Of, of the 90s, right? right? And then all of that was infiltrated and it kind of crumbled down. Mm-hmm. But I was, uh, I became politically active in, in a way uh, that is not, I don't think, very normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For people, because it was like a conglomerate of socialist, communist, educators, mm-hmm. people doing, like we're, you know, involved with the Black Liberation Movement, the Indigenous Liberation Movement, Latin America, the Caribbean, we would mm-hmm. get folks uh, come and speak all the time at the. Mm. So that was like kind of like my political education, and the first time that I realized that I was a like a solid socialist, I was seventeen, mm-hmm. and it was because I went to the World Youth Festival in uh, Cuba. Wow! And I was interested. I've always been interested in doing social work, so I wanted to learn more about how they did social work and how they did uh, popular education. And I actually met with some folks out there. And I wanted to stay in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And I was told, you know, this is great. (laughs) (laughs) We love that you love our revolution. But how about you go to the United States and make your own revolution? Right. And that's That's what they're asking us to do. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of the task. But I always remain in touch with them. But at 17, that was kind of like the marker when I was like, everything that I've been reading and everything that I've been hearing is actually Mm -hmm. possible. Like, it is possible. And in 97, the... um, the special period was still happening. Mm-hmm. So Cuba was under extreme, like, you know, the impact of, of um, the fall of the Soviet Union, 
the impact of the blockade, like right. all of these things are harshly felt mm -hmm. during the special period. But the people's, the people's like will and the, pe the people's commitment to the revolution and the people's like capacity to understand that this is a collective project that they, that they were mm -hmm. moving forward was life changing for me, mm -hmm. was life changing for me. And yeah. so 17. That's when yeah, I and that was a time also when a lot of propaganda, I'm sure, was doubling down on them oh, because yeah. they're going through hardships. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the strength of the people, man. All right, yeah. Karina, yeah, I want to hear about you and your journey. Well, I became a feminist first. I felt like a feminist when I was 17. And I, I come from a working class background similar to Claudia. A lot of members of my family were undocumented. So we, you know, grew up very... Um, distrustful of the police, obviously, but the government in general. Um, between Long Beach and Fontana, you know, like where I grew up in Long Beach, my aunt was, um, you know, held up at gunpoint twice in the same spot, you know, where she lived. And there was constantly like helicopters and it was just that time. So there was always kind of a lot of the oppression of the state was kind of always present in my life. But I didn't, it, it, I had internalized those things as part of our community where we live, right? And so I didn't really see, I didn't see like the system at that point. I didn't see capitalism at that point. I just kind of saw, you know, my environment, working class people. And, and so to me, the enemy was the patriarchy because the, my oppressor was my older brother. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was my oppressor. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the kind of sexism that I was seeing and that I was learning about in society. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I sort of ha I had that, like, this feminist flag, you know, early on because I felt that, I felt the, the machismo more. Mm -hmm. And I just hadn't even understood the poverty or the, you know, or that kind of unnecessary humiliation that my family was put through mm -hmm. as anything but our own. That's how I understood it. Yeah. Um, and not that my family wasn't working hard or anything, but just that those were sort of like, this was the condition. And I just didn't know that anything else was possible. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, and it was, you know, I wasn't, we weren't, you know, suffering, um, but, but my dad had to work many, many jobs to be able to mm -hmm. keep us fed and to keep the lights on and so those were the those are the kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. And then I win the lottery when I'm 18 years old and I get to go to college. And I felt like I win the lottery because I knew this is impossible for people of my background to be able to go to college. And so I win the lottery and I go to New York City to Columbia and I'm like, oh my God. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm so grateful. What can I do to deserve this like miracle, mm -hmm. right? Of being able to like get out and go study and do this at this place that is costs more a year than what my family receives, you know, in, in wages. Like it's incredible, mm -hmm. right? Well, so colleges, they're marketed as like paradises. Right, right. So I, I won the lottery. I, I, I was like Jesse and Saved by the Bell. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. You know, and actually that's how I heard about Columbia was from watching TV. From Jesse. From Jesse. Um, so I go to Columbia and then I'm just like, you know, trying to do something because I know how lucky I was. And so I joined all the little activist groups on campus. I was on everybody's list. I was Democrats, women's groups, economic justice, like just every kind of group I was in. And I was starting to organize and I really wanted to do something. And so um, one of the campaigns that I was exposed to as a student was a student labor solidarity campaign. This was a national organization called United Students Against Sweatshops. And it combined the perfect, it was the perfect practical thing I could do to make a contribution in the moment, which was I have this unique position at Columbia by some miracle, I'm here, what am I gonna do to help something, right? Mm -hmm. And so by using our power as students to be in solidarity with worker struggles that were happening around the world or in Salvador, Dominican Republic, Mexico, we could force these sweatshops to improve the conditions of working class people. And so that was a very worthwhile, practical thing that I can actually contribute. I was into it. 
And then I meet comrades. <laughs> I meet the comrades. The party was really small back then in 2006. It was just a few people in New York City. But they posed a very important Marxist question to me. Well, what happens if you win? Let's say that your campaign is so successful. And they're not against, he wasn't against the campaign. Yeah, but he just was pushing it a little bit further. So what happens if you win? If you manage through all your organizing to get Nike to be a good capitalist, what happens under capitalism? And I was studying economics because I was freaking class. So I was trying to make money. I want to be a banker. I wanted to be on Wall Street. I was like, I'm going to get my family out, you know. So... Um, when I was, so I thought about it, and I was, well, okay, you know, if I guess if Nike becomes a better capitalist, then, well, that means that the, you know, um, investors are going to invest in the place that is going to give them a higher rate of profit. Mm -hmm. So they're going to pull their money from Nike, and they're going to put their money into a worse mm -hmm. corporation, a corporation that is more exploitative, mm -hmm. that carries even less. And then what does that mean under the system? Mm -hmm. It means that now... Reebok, let's say, becomes even bigger mm -hmm. and even more powerful because this corporation is one in a system. Mm -hmm. And so then I sort of, that, that, that was the logic. And I understood it's not just a few corporations. It's not just a few bad apples. This system was designed this way and people are benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why our families are suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's a needless suffering because we live in the richest country in the world and there's actually no reason for our poverty and exploitation other than to enrich a few individuals. Mm -hmm. So then that like all the like kind of, hum you know, like humility that I felt and gratitude that I felt for being there turned into like a humiliation that this is what they're doing to our people. Mm -hmm. This is, they're benefiting from this. And so I became anti-capitalist and I became a socialist but I feel like I still, even though I became a socialist and I joined the party and I, the party was involved in all the different struggles and brought together all these things, and I saw so much more hope in the party than just in the student movement because the student movement was important, but it was just students. And I felt like if anything is going to change, it's going to happen because working class people make it change. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. to me, felt that's the most powerful force. Mm -hmm. and, but I didn't necessarily believe that socialism was possible in the United States. I just thought, this is right. This is the right thing, and I'm gonna do this. And it took time to actually be able to see, I went to Cuba too, and, and to be able to see in my own community, I traveled a lot you know, later in life in Texas, organizing around reproductive justice, and I saw working class people who are actually socialists, mm -hmm. and sort of those things made me feel stronger. Like, actually, no, it is possible. And we are more than capable. Mm -hmm. And actually, like, a lot of this stuff is innate to us. Yeah. We already help each other. We already are the most generous. We're already the most capable. Mm -hmm. We do incredible things mm -hmm. with nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So much creativity is squandered under this system. And the most awful people are at the top of it. That's not tenable. That cannot exist forever. But we do have to get organized. Mm -hmm. And so I, I understood that as a as a project that I wanted to contribute to mm -hmm. and that I believe actually can actually change things. Mm. Yeah. Damn, well I'm ready to vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I mean I've been in the party many years, but it's amazing always to hear people's personal journeys because as organizers, it's you know, everybody has their journey into um, organization or into a party, and everybody has to kind of really internalize and, and feel it in their bones that this is this is what they want to do with their lives. That mm -hmm. this is that they understand their own story and 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 weave it into the the collective one. You know, the collective force that we all need to to end capitalism. Um, but I wanted to to maybe get into some details too because you know we talked about you guys being mothers we talked about how you became socialists and and kind of all the little pieces that you stumbled um upon across the way to socialism um where do these things show up in the political program being working class being mothers being women where does it show up <laughs> 
Shows up everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> everywhere in the program. I... No, no one needs socialism more than mothers. Yeah. Yeah. Like... More than mothers, <laughs> immigrant communities, mm-hmm. black people, right. indigenous people. I mean, there's Children, historically marginalized also. people because capitalism has historically marginalized people. Mm-hmm. Like, that is that is it. That is the, the very basis of it. And I think, you know, to think about the program is to understand that it's not a matter of policy. It's a mm-hmm. matter of reorganization of society and redistribution of wealth. When we're talking about seize the top 100 corporations, and Karina always says it, that's like a third. Mm-hmm. That's not even yeah. all of the corporations that need to be seized. We're, we're starting there. That's a mm-hmm. starting point. And that starting point can allow for millions of people in this country to breathe. And for millions or maybe billions of people across the globe to breathe. Like just one, 100 corporations ceased, you know. Um, how about, again, we take a collective wealth that is, we produce that collectively and it has been hijacked. It has been stolen mm-hmm. by a, a small group of billionaires. And we're not saying let's tax the rich. We're saying we just don't want them. Mm-hmm. We don't want them. We don't need them, you know. Fidel would say, no los queremos, no los necesitamos. <laughs> and that's exactly it. We don't need them. We don't want them. Um, because they don't contribute anything to society. They don't contribute the level of creativity, the mm-hmm. level of work power. Like, in terms of, like, social programs and benefits, they actually benefit from us not having them. Mm-hmm. And so we don't need them. They're parasites. That's what they are. And so we start from that space we say that you know end the war on black america means reorganizing society in a way that serves those again who have been historically marginalized Mm -hmm. this country was founded on slavery and it was founded on genocide and whether we think about it or not in these terms this is still happening Mm -hmm. prison labor is slavery it 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 is and it services corporations And so it was modified, but it's still there. If you think about the ways in which 800 people in this country, the wealthiest country in the world, die every day from poverty-related causes, that is some sort of genocide that's happening that nobody talks about. Because Mm -hmm. you're not talking about a small group of like a small group of people. You're talking about 800 people a day Mm -hmm. in the wealthiest country. And so the, the very character, the very nature of U.S. and U.S. capitalism and U.S. empire cannot be approached as a single policy change. Like, we mm-hmm. need the reorganization of society, and that's what the platform speaks to. And no one else, more than mothers, you know, folks that are part of the LGBTQA community, Black folk, Indigenous folk, poor white working class people, no more than those people are the ones that are going to benefit the most from the mm-hmm. reorganization of society. Right. Yeah. You know, we say we often say working people make society run. Working people should run society. It's a very simple slogan, but it's a fundamental truth. Mm-hmm. Like we actually have to really think about it and understand it. Because right now, the billionaires who run the society, we know exactly where they're taking us, right? They spend all of our money on war and racism, all of it. The only thing that both parties agree to is trillions and trillions of dollars for war, right? That's the only thing. They can't act immediately and swiftly to fund housing or health care or education. For those things, there's, they, can never, they can never agree. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to sending more billions of dollars for proxy war in Ukraine or to continue to, you know, expand this ridiculous war with China, like they that's where they put their money. So there is an incredible amount of waste in the society. And it's not because of just like one or two politicians, Biden versus Trump. It's because of capitalism because of capitalism. And it's not, you can go through the line and there's so many examples of this. Mm -hmm. So war is one of the biggest ways that we, um, you know, waste our resources. But there's a lot of waste under capitalism. If you think about the billions and billions of pounds of food that are wasted every year in this country, it's, it's it's a crime. It's a crime because there's people in this country and there's people around the world who are hungry. 
But because of capitalism, because the rule of profit over people, billions of pounds of food are thrown away instead of being used to feed people. So this is the system that we're talking about. And so like this, there are many other examples of needless suffering, suffering of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's why we say we can't, it's not enough to tax the billionaires. We want them out of power entirely. Mm -hmm. It should not be up to them. It should not be up to them what they do with the wealth that they have squandered from society. Mm -hmm. Because we know that they are benefiting from the pure exploitation of people. They have not created this amount of wealth. It's impossible. They're not even able to spend the amount of wealth that they've stolen from the working class in this country and around the world. They'll never be able to spend it in the lifetime. Mm -hmm. All of that wealth has been stolen. And so we're bringing out that aspect that it's actually working people who do everything, that they are parasites. We don't need them and we don't owe them anything. Mm -hmm. We don't need them and we don't owe them anything. So we actually have to end this system in order to have the kind of change that we need in the society where our resources are, be are being used to improve our lives, to expand democracy. We have to take them out of power mm -hmm. because it cannot be up to them. Mm -hmm. In the pandemic, we saw who actually matters in society. Essential CEO doesn't exist, right? It's essential worker because when the pandemic happened, it didn't really matter if the CEO showed up or not to work. What mattered is if the nurses showed up to work, mm -hmm. if the you know fast food workers, if the delivery workers, if the truck drivers, if the teachers, if the doctors, like so many low wage workers who do everything in society that are completely undervalued in the society, mm -hmm. but that are essential essential and it's our whole class that's essential the working class is the essential class right and the pandemic kind of showed that to us that a lot of the things that they always say are impossible um, were actually very quickly attainable they were able to um, send direct payments to people to be able to you know all these things we have to fight for to end evictions and foreclosures, they were able to immediately do it, to have free public transportation, they were able to immediately do it in a lot of places, not everywhere, free Wi-Fi, like all of these things were possible and now the Democrats have rolled them back, have taken away these rights. They're the ones who are taking people off of Medicare that they actually qualify for. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's, that's a policy decision. <laughs> they're, they're deciding that they'd rather, um, you know, let people die of preventable disease in this country than use any of the wealth that they've stolen to provide that for them. Mm -hmm. And that's, we can expect the same. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, they, they choose, their policy is to choose poverty all the time. Mm -hmm. And the poverty for the majority of people. Yeah. Right, make the, the working class pay. All the, yeah. time. all the time. You know, if the, if the banks are falling apart, let the poor people pay for it. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's just... It's their choice every time. You have millions of people oh, that yeah. can't afford yeah. to pay back their student, student right. loan. You know, Talk that, about like, things that hold back your life. That yeah. is another yeah. form of slavery. Yeah. And so when we like, oh, we abolished slavery, it was abolished. It was, it transitioned into another type of slavery, you know, and it, and it actually was necessary for the economy at that time for that to happen. Because we forget that too, that it wasn't like the people in the North we're better than the people in the South. Right, during the Civil War. It, is, it mm -hmm. was, it, it, that was not it. It was mm -hmm. a, an economic decision that was made. It was necessary to, to be able to maintain the capitalist system at that time. And so I think we need to be more conscious of the fact that this game that the, the Republicans and the Democrats play with our lives mm -hmm. is inherent to the capitalist system. They're not there to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. If they were to solve our problems, they will be out of business. <laughs> literally. And, and literally out of yeah. business. They don't want to be out of business. They want to be able to dangle the rights. You know what? We will solve the question of reproductive rights for women. Mm. Biden ha had the possibility of doing that in his first two years in his term. Mm -hmm. And he did not do it. He chose right. not to do it. Right. He can't even say the word abortion. <laughs> Just like if you look at, at where he talks about right. reproductive Reproductive choice, reproductive. He he himself cannot bring himself up to talk about abortion as a as a human right that we have as women to cho choose over our mm -hmm. bodies. And so we need to be a little sharper. Just because we keep doing the same thing over and over and over, doesn't mean that they will 
grant us anything mm -hmm. because they, they haven't just granted, they've conceded to certain things to maintain capitalism mm -hmm. and they will concede to certain things, but they will not grant us the liberation that we deserve. Mm -hmm. And with this campaign, we're trying to broaden that horizon of what it is that we actually can win and what it is that we deserve because our enemy is going to tell us this, mm -hmm. right? And this is how they give us the little scraps that they do every few years, right? Yeah. But we actually have a whole world of things, right? So when we say like seize the top 100, so there's 1.7 million corporations in this country. If we were to leave, you know, 1,699,900 of them in place, leave them alone, don't even touch them, and we were just to take the top 100, just imagine what we would be able to accomplish. This is like Amazon, Walmart, all these health insurance companies, these parasitical big insurance, big yeah. pharma, big agriculture, mm -hmm. the big banks. If you think about it, we already paid for those big banks. Those are ours. We paid for those in 2008, mm -hmm. right? Those are our banks. But we talk about seizing the top 100. It's about resources and it's about power. Mm -hmm. And it's about taking back power. Over the last decades, what these billionaires have done is they've privatized and they've taken over all of these things that were never theirs to begin with. Mm -hmm. Public goods that were never theirs to begin with. They tried to, with public education, they first they underfund things and then they privatize things. Mm -hmm. And they try to do this with public education, and we saw with the charter schools. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, we have teachers' unions that were able to fight back. So they mm -hmm. weren't able to completely win that fight. But this is what they do, is that they underfund all of these resources that are actually belong to everyone. Mm -hmm. But they privatize them, and they steal them from the people. Mm -hmm. And they're doing this with water in the state of California right now. You know, a few rich people that have been benefiting and owning the water really, right? And now we have all these terrible climate-related problems of, of drought, of wildfires, and the people who are paying the price are the working class people, but the people who created the problems are the rich. The fossil fuel companies have known for decades that their whole industry was going to create these problems, and they didn't care. So what we're saying is they created the problems, they should pay for it. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be able to solve the problem that they created. We are going to have to take right. over. Right. So we actually need power. It's not enough to tax the same corrupt people who put our lives in danger every day. Mm -hmm. We need them out of power. Right. So when we say seize the top 100, we're talking about, yes, we need resources to be able to provide for the needs of people, right? Mm -hmm. And we're saying, and we need power to make the decisions that are important in our lives. Picking between two billionaires is not enough. It's never been enough. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to decide as a people where we're gonna put our resources. And the vast majority of the people do not wanna put their resources to genocide. They mm -hmm. do not wanna go into a nuclear war. They do not want to, to take away the rights of people to vote. They don't want any of those things, but the billionaire class is running things, and that's why we have to take them out of power. Right. They pose an existential threat to us, which is why your slogan is... And capitalism, capitalism before, before it ends us. us. Yeah, and I, when I first read that slogan, I took it extremely literally, because it's, it's true. But you know, you're saying like, it's not gonna end by itself. No. We gotta build a power. We have to, we have to build amongst our people um, we have to put forward a political program that can shift the what you say, you know, what we think is so narrow, our choices. We need to shift that to to become much broader, to say, actually, all the resources are there. All the yes. skills that we have yes. are here. Yes. Um, but we need to be oriented in, yes. in you know, in a certain way. Um, and I, I actually want to, you know, transition us to talking about like if we if I was a person just looking at your program um, or in general, as a person, you know, living in America, like, I feel like there's a lot of ways that, you know, we know that the system has to end and it poses an existential threat to us, but there's, people are not feeling, most people don't feel very empowered, mm -hmm. you know, and I, not, not most, but, you know, there's, there's strong currents, you know, and, and capitalism tries to convince us that we don't have the, the ability and we don't have the unity. Um, and that's kind of where I think they're also trying to shift the culture between people or the relationships between between people 
because I see, um, you know, like they're rolling back rights, you know, like they're rolling back abortion rights. They're rolling back all types of, you know, gay and trans rights too. They're dangling that in front of us um, because of the games that they're playing. Um, but when they play those games, it also gives open license for for that kind of culture of, of disempowerment of, and hopelessness to breed. So I want you guys to talk about how, do, you know, where are we now in terms of that? And how do we, how do we move? Um, how do we move our class towards socialism? I mean, I think part of the contribution of the campaign is the intervention in the battle of ideas, mm -hmm. the battle of ideas, the battle of emotions. The capitalists have had a long time. And not only have they had a lot of time, they've also had very sophisticated mechanisms and they've had all the resources mm -hmm. and the power to decide how to utilize those resources to benefit them. So every institution that we could think of, I mean, and I would invite folks to think about it, church, school, the media, which is a corporate media, um, and many other spaces, violence is very much normalized mm -hmm. in yeah. general. Like you, you buy, you go and you buy video games and it's like, you know, they put the little sticker advisory on it. Um, and you have a kid that's six years old, seven years old, playing a video game that no adult should be playing. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a normalization of violence. You turn on the TV and you look at the media, at the news, and it's like, there's never ever anything that talks about the strength of working class people, mm -hmm. the struggle, the fight, the history. Right. It's always about how working class people behave as animals mm. and how criminal and delinquent certain sectors of our class are. Right. That's all the news That's is. That's all the news. When I pick up the news at the in the subway yeah. and I flip through the pages, 90% of it. That's all it crime. is. Yeah. Yeah, and it's is 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 also not only internal to the United States but also external to the United States. Mm -hmm. And you grow up in a society where you are told that you need to figure out shit on your own. Mm -hmm. If you're poor, it's because of your own deficiency, not because there's a system that produces poverty and impoverishes you and your community. Therefore, it's your deficiency. And along with all of these different things, the way that human beings internalize the abnormality of it, because it's abnormal, mm -hmm. is developing all sorts of mental health care. Yeah. Issue, like mental health conditions mm -hmm. with lack of mental health care support. And if you think about it, the psychiatry world is an industry in itself. The psychology industry, as a social worker, I'm saying this, healthcare is an industry in this country. Mm -hmm. And so that is also violent. So you have all of these different things that are very violent, and then we want to scream, oh my God, when human beings are being violent against each other. Mm -hmm. Where kids are bullying other kids in school. Mm -hmm. Where you have someone who's going around punching women in the face. Yeah. Like, the society in which we live has produced that mm -hmm. because it's a violent society. And in so many different ways, the state, the capitalist state, wages war on our communities. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot resolve these issues of interpersonal violence, of violence that is part of a culture. Like, if you look at the entertainment industry right now, it's crazy. All the things that are coming out, P. Diddy, you know, uh, folks are talking about Hollywood. And, yeah, Nickelodeon. And Nickelodeon. And, right. But, like, you have to put that into context. Mm -hmm. All of these industries have been violent. It's right. not only P. Diddy. It's not only Epstein. It's a whole industry. It's a whole system. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, cannot do the service of the capitalists individualizing that, personalizing that. It's not. We need to call it into account. We need to say this is a problem. But we need to go deeper and say this is a problem of capitalism. Capitalism produces this, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And if we're unable to do that, then we're unable to tackle it. If we don't change the very basis of society, the economic system that profits from that, mm -hmm. then we cannot pretend that we're solving anything. There's yeah. going to be, I mean, there's been a lot of P. Diddy's mm -hmm. throughout history. There's been a lot of, you know, 
you were talking about what was going on with the with the full the person that's punching women in the face yeah. in New York City, and right. I'm and we were talking about it. We said, is it that is new or is it that is being amplified? Because when I was when I was growing up in the '90s, they were walking around with blades, mm-hmm. cutting women's faces. Yeah, or you know, early even earlier in the 1990s, there were people that would actually you know there were syringes. There was a whole like mm-hmm. fringy about. HIV and AIDS and people were being syringed. So it's like this type of violence has been there. Mm-hmm. And it's and it comes even at a at a higher rate when we are facing an economic crisis. Yeah. Um where the most historically marginalized are impacted in the worst of the ways. Mm-hmm. And so what we're seeing now is a product of the crisis in which we are, which is economic, which is ideological, which is cultural and is also political because there's a political crisis a crisis of legitimacy in this country and mm-hmm. that is even more hopeless for folks because it's yeah. like our political leaders can't respond to it mm-hmm. i i agree um i think one of the challenges one of the tools of capitalism is the isolation mm-hmm. the isolation you can see it in all of our <laughs> whenever you travel around the around this country you can you can see it and and people and especially you feel it when you're when you become a mom, mm-hmm. right? The isolation, um, the isolation. We're social beings, you know. Like that isolation will kill us. It it's depressing. It's disempowering, and um, the society is really set up for people to kind of go about things on their own. You know, like any types of organizations are when they're working class organizations, they're maligned. Mm-hmm. But when you think about the rich, you know, their their business associations, they always come together as a group, right? Mm-hmm. But our unions, when we come together as a group, those things are vilified, criminalized, right? But there's power in numbers. There's power in collectivity, in, in being part of a community. And so I think like, you know, people sometimes like, they wonder, oh, how how come you're so optimistic? And it's not, I'm not innately just like optimistic. I get optimism from being part of a collective, Mm -hmm. from being part of a movement, of a struggle. I think we feel a lot of strength when we come out together and we're even in protests together, we're in events together because we see we're together. We all agree about this, you know, and and you see hope in that. When you're isolated and you feel like you're, you're just alone and it's all your fault and there's nothing you can do about it like that kills our spirit it yeah. kills the possibility of a future and that's what they want mm-hmm. right. and we turn that's exactly to what they want types of coping mechanisms yeah. exactly yeah. Mm-hmm. to try to you know medicate ourselves and try to just keep dragging along right and so this is the importance of being part of a collective of being part of a movement that those mm-hmm. things are are actually what feed and drive us mm-hmm. You know, if you think about the Obama period, there was so much enthusiasm and energy. All these people who came together all around the country and did petitioning, all this different stuff to to try to make a change in this country, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, we know now that all that was just BS, that, you know, he ran on the Si Se Puede slogan, and then when he got in office, no se pudo, no se pudo. And he wasn't able to do any of the things, right? Even though he could have, right? Let's always remember that the Democrats had a super majority during Obama. They could have passed universal health care. Mm-hmm. They could have done all of the things, that all the promises that they make every time election season is. They actually could have done those things. So we should never let them off the hook. Mm-hmm. But those, that sort of cycle, right, of lots of different promises, and they're never able to actually complete them because of the capitalist system itself is very, um, it leads to a lot of cynicism. And it leads to apathy. And it's a justifiable apathy. Mm-hmm. It's actually a consciousness. It's an awareness of how mm-hmm. bankrupt the system yeah. is. And so it's not really about feeding people illusions about this rigged system. Right. It's really about channeling our energy to what can actually make change. And that's always social movements. Mm-hmm. It's always been social movements where we're able to make change, where we're able to gather. The politicians will always come in at the last second to do the Photoshop, photo shoot and to kind of get credit and to redirect people. That's why we need our own independent working class organizations mm-hmm. to be able to keep going, to be able to, yes, we're fighting for reforms, but more than that, we need to transform this whole thing 
but we're only going to be able to do that if we come together and we get organized. And so I think it's not like a one moment thing because we live in this system. We live in this system. So we're going to go up and down and the movement mm. goes up and down, mm -hmm. but we need strong organizations to carry us through and political education to remind us of our history, of what it is that we're actually fighting for. Those are the things that feed us and keep us going. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're so important for us to be a part of. Because otherwise, we will feel isolated, we will feel small, we will disengage, and that's what they want. Mm -hmm. They don't care if we're apathetic. They, want, they would rather us be apathetic mm -hmm. and not care than be hopeful and want to change things. Mm -hmm. That's what they're actually right. afraid of. And they want us to rip each other apart, too. Yes. Yeah. And that's why all, all yes. day it's about crime. All day it's about how people can't get along. Mm -hmm. right. But it's not it's not true. Yeah, no, yeah. And it's fight that urge to, only, to disengage. Yeah. The only the only reason that we have had the capacity to survive mm -hmm. is because of organized struggle, but it's also the sense of solidarity amongst yeah. working class people. Yes. Like our people know solidarity because they have to utilize it as a survival mechanism every day. Yes. Every day. And so, you know, but these are things that are not exposed these are things that are not talked about these mm -hmm. are things that are not celebrated right mm -hmm. violence is celebrated right you know destruction is celebrated mm -hmm. i mean that these people have the capacity like and and the the audacity like the the crazy audacity to be on on the news channels to write news articles and not call things for what they are mm -hmm. like you have a whole population of people who are able to say with boldness that what's happening in Palestine is genocide. Mm -hmm. But yet the corporate media does not have the ovaries <laughs> <laughs> to call it for what it is. Mm -hmm. That also makes people feel crazy. Yeah. Because people feel it, people know it, people see it on their social media day in and day out. But these people are telling me that it's something completely different. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, and so I think in building community, in building organization, in, in being able to find like-minded people towards a transformative plan, because that's the other right. piece. That's the other piece. Mm -hmm. You could find like-minded people and just kind of marinate in that sauce mm -hmm. and right. not do anything. Right. But you want to find like-minded people to, to take transformative action. Yeah. Right. Once you do that, you feel less crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, you feel less alone. Once you do that, you find more strength. Once you do that, you could manage right. whatever levels of anxiety or depression you have. Right. But isolation is recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And it's actually validating. It is, you know, fueling mm -hmm. what the capitalist system is. And so we should fight that at all costs because that's, that's you're talking about relations, right? Mm -hmm. Like interpersonal relations. The human being is relational. Yeah, we're our capacity to be is based on the relationships we build, mm -hmm. our relationship to work, our relationship to the community we live in, mm -hmm. in relationship to our family members, to our friends. Mm -hmm. All of that plays into whether we could be like whole human beings. And right. the society in which we live is very focused on dismembering us as human beings. Yeah. Yeah. And this like fear mongering that happens that we see mm -hmm. all the time in our in the newspapers and make us fear each other and fear yeah. ourselves and right. fear everything, right? Like this is a tool that they use the way and it's because they own the corporate media that they can promote all of the ideas about our people being criminals, right. whether it's immigrants, whether it's petty thefts, whether it's drug related, mm -hmm. like this is the way that they dehumanize us. Mm -hmm. But the number one crime in this country is wage theft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People will think like identity theft or some, you know, crime right. that like poverty or something. No, it's wage theft. It's the richest corporations that rob their workers. They're already paying us poverty wages, but that's not enough. They still those two. Right. So that's why we have to bring out the system. Mm -hmm. We have to know who our enemy is. If we don't know who our enemy is, then we're going to keep going around in circles right. forever. And that's what they want. Right. They want us to keep going, choosing between the, Claudia says, the, yeah. the red poison and the blue poison, right? Yeah. And they're both poison and going around in circles and legitimizing a system that is profiting off mm -hmm. of our suffering, mm -hmm. yeah. right? 
we have to build our own tools, our, our own organizations to be able to actually really transform yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Legitimizing yeah. them while killing each other. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. That's what they want. Right. <laughs> and I think on the top of, of organization, I feel like our characterization of, you know, the system not only being political, economic, also cultural and ideological, all these pieces are, are you know, from my personal journey is like, all those pieces were why I recognized that I wanted to be in a party. I wanted to be in an organization. Um, and I think the time to for that to, to battle that existential threat is now. Mm-hmm. So we cannot wait for like, you know, our conditions to get better. We cannot wait for our relations necessarily to be perfect in order to start mm-hmm. to, to repair and to build what we need to build. Um, so I wanna I want you guys to talk about, you know, building leadership. Uh, amongst the working class, building leadership, you know, um, with the working class, but with the party too, and you're talking about like women's leadership too, and and all types of leadership. Um, how do how do we navigate, you know, from from the here to what we want? Well, I've I've had the privilege that because of the job that I was doing, where I was uh, in a national organizer position, I've been able to travel around the country, mm-hmm. and so that exposed me to so many working class leaders, Mm -hmm. women who really make the impossible possible, Mm -hmm. um, who are in the poorest circumstances in some of the poorest parts of the country that are, um, you know, the lifeline of their community. And they're making, you know, (sighs) it's incredible what they do um, under these circumstances with scraps. and so being able to go to very rural parts of the country, especially in Texas, I, I attribute the women that I met in Texas with like really, really strengthening my convictions that socialism is possible. Even if they identify or don't identify as socialists because of the who they are and the way that they organize their community and fight for their community and the leadership that they give, that they bring to their community. And I felt like when I went to Cuba, I was able to see like real, you know, wasn't just like a poster, right, of Che, Mm -hmm. but like who are the people that make the revolution, that sustain Mm -hmm. the revolution, Mm -hmm. that keep it going. And it was a lot of working class, I mean, it is working class women. (laughs) And they're all the doctors, they're all the Mm -hmm. social workers, and this is very similar here. And when I was in South Texas, working with community organizers and community health promoters um, in this very rural and impoverished part of the country where there's like no paved roads where like it's you're in the united states it's technically the united states um but it's like you know it's people are living in really dire situations Mm -hmm. um they don't have running water they don't have electricity they're fighting for electricity they're Mm -hmm. fighting for things like that in the richest country in the world you wouldn't believe it like they don't even appear in like they don't even have gps in some of these remote places in the richest country in the world And um, these women have organized themselves in such a way that they're able to fight along all these different fronts and they come together. And if they don't have a ride, they give each other rides and they come together, you know, after they drop their kids home, you know, after they drop their kids to school, they'll have community health fairs and they bring together the little resources that exist Mm -hmm. and share information and knock on doors. And they are the life of the community. They keep Mm -hmm. people alive. That's they're socialists, whether they identify as socialists or not. That's that's who they are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And in a socialist society, they would be empowered. They would Mm -hmm. be given resources Mm -hmm. and those would be our leaders. Right. And so and the men in the community wouldn't be like, well, who gave you? No, there you know, (laughs) the the title. It would be so obvious. Right. right? Exactly. And those are the people who would run the government. And that's that is the situation of socialist countries that have made a revolution. Mm -hmm. And then the working class takes power. And now that's not always perfect because our lives are not perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, the Russian Revolution immediately after they won power, they were invaded by 20 imperialist countries. Mm-hmm. And so they're, because of capitalism, because of the nature of U.S. imperialism, countries have to are constantly bombarded whenever mm-hmm. they create a process for them to take back their resources. And we've seen it in all of the dirty wars in Latin America that when a popular democratic government comes into play, then 
here comes the CIA, here comes the School of the Americas to train mm -hmm. the torturers and to turn things back so that U.S. corporations rule no matter what. So this is like the enemy that we're fighting against. But the possibility and the, um, the things that we need already exist. Mm -hmm. But the class consciousness is what we're trying to build with this campaign, right. the socialist consciousness. Because if we don't know what it is that we're fighting for, we're never going to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's what one of the benefits of the fear mongering of the anti-communism in this country is that it leaves us without a hope, without yeah. a positive political project that we can fight for. Right. And that's what this campaign is trying to defeat. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the question of like political organization, I think that... Yes, there's, and I, I agree, and I think it. we bring those communities with us, right? Like, the work that I did in the Bronx, in Washington Heights, the work that I've done with different communities across the globe, we bring those um, concerns, but also those aspirations mm -hmm. and that vision for the future into, into the work. And there's di different types of organizations. There's the student groups. Mm -hmm. There are the collectives of artists. There are those... Folks that within nonprofit world, the nonprofit world, there are good folks doing good work, advancing good things for working class people with the best of intentions, even if they hit a wall mm -hmm. constantly, right? Because that's another that's another thing that we need to also admit that in all of these spaces you hit a wall. Mm -hmm. And I think the importance of political parties is is so critical because it plays a different role. It's kind of pushing the envelope a little more mm -hmm. and saying, all of these institutions and all of these places, you know, you look at all the comrades and friends that have been organizing within academic institutions against their support to genocidal Israel. They've all been disciplined. Mm -hmm. A lot of these groups have been either booted off campus. A lot of these young people are now facing charges because they've stood against genocide mm -hmm. within their academia. That should show them the limitations of that academic space, mm. right? If you're an educator, you've also fa you've faced yeah. a level a level of disciplinary action. If you're organizing, doing work in in nonprofits, you again you could lead mutual aid, you could do abolitionist work, you could do all of these different things, but you're gonna hit that wall. Because the people financing it, the hedge funds, philanthropy, mm. it it actually is fed by capitalism. And mm. so there's a wall. Mm. And so the political party that we need, a political party that is independent of the capitalist rule and that has a socialist vision mm -hmm. is very necessary because it's about pushing that wall. It's right. about breaking that wall. Mm -hmm. And it's about doing that collectively, not, not as a group right. in isolation to the rest. Right. That's why the party has, I mean, and people would, would say, like, why is it that you work so many different campaigns? I mean, we work in many different <laughs> campaigns. Invitations, we work essentially. in many different campaigns because the working class occupies many different spaces. Yeah. And we are where the working class people are. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's actually affirming. That should be something that actually draws people in. The right. fact that we can't have campaigns around housing, that we can have campaigns anti-war you know, that we could have campaigns against police brutality. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to be able to identify and work with leaders that are moving community in the direction of a socialist vision, whether they understand it or not. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, the socialist vision is liberation for everyone. Yeah. Even those people who do not assume the politic, the ideology of socialism would benefit yeah. under right. socialism. Right. Like, they would... Many of the women, I mean, all of the women in the Soviet Union benefited from having community kitchens, mm -hmm. from having tutoring programs for the kids. Right. For like, women benefited from socialist yeah. politics and a socialist revolution. Maternity leave. Maternity leave. Right. The okay. same child yeah. care. The same thing in Cuba. Like you're not. You go and you don't have to ask. You know whether you have your health insurance card or not in your pocket because you mm -hmm. don't need a health insurance card mm -hmm. because. It's free and is accessible and is quality healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so who wouldn't benefit from that? Who wouldn't benefit from going from a pre-K all the way to grad school without any debt? Right. Like everyone except for the capitalists. Right. Yeah. <laughs> everyone except for the capitalists. And then right. why should we continue to jeopardize our, our well-being, mm -hmm. to jeopardize our interest 
for a small group of people. Right. So political organization is the only thing that will take us to a place where we want to build a force to go toe to toe with the force of capitalism and defeat them. Mm-hmm. It is the only thing and has been yeah. proven historically. Now, we're not dealing with perfect systems and we're not dealing with perfect people. 100%. So, you know, the expectation that we're going to go into this movement space, that we're going to go into this political organization that's going to be heaven on earth, Mm-mm. is a lie, is a, is a completely false expectation mm-hmm. because human beings come with the baggage of their experience. Yeah. And as people, we go into spaces with the commitment of transforming ourselves and transforming the space. Mm-hmm. But we can't do that as individuals. We we have to do that collectively. Right. I need a cara to hold me accountable to what I say <laughs> that I believe in if right. I'm acting otherwise. And political organization does that. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I feel like there's so many different elements that are such a of benefit to yeah. our people. And we live in a society that has historically, and I would dare say in the last 30, 40 years has um, created a vacuum and allowed a space for other type of organizations that are financed by the capitalists to Mm -hmm. say what is correct and not correct in organizing Mm -hmm. and has left out the possibility of a political organization. And we Mm -hmm. need to be able to criticize that and we need to be able to explore why that is. And that is precisely to weaken our strength as political agents Mm -hmm. in this country. Right. Yeah, everything we do has to be empowering the working class, of not, the, not being spectators building to the, the struggle. Building the confidence right. of working class people. Mm-hmm. And we build the confidence of working class people by reclaiming our history, right. reclaiming our lineage, reminding people of who our friends are and who our enemies are, mm-hmm. reminding people that we have the strength in collectiveness. Mm-hmm. Like the parasites that we just talked about, that small group of billionaires will be nothing yeah. with the collectivity and the workforce of poor and working class people. They would be nothing mm-hmm. without us. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's a lot of power. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, labor organizers understand that. And that's why they're able to sit down and negotiate uh, contracts. Mm-hmm. But what if we didn't have to negotiate our exploitation with billionaires? Yeah. What if we had actually the power to run Amazon, to run uh, Walmart, to run and actually decide mm-hmm. how our profits will be spent. Mm-hmm. To utilize tech, the technological advances, not to kick us out of work, but to supplement the work that we do and still get paid for the right. work that we do and have the benefits that we... Like, in that equation, billionaires are not necessary. Mm-hmm. We've been taught that they are. Because somehow they're the ones that have control. And so I think, you know, political organization does a lot, but it's also a way of us gaining the confidence that has been stolen from right. us with our wage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's true. Wage, dignity. Yeah, wage, dignity, integrity. Like right. the notion of like it is possible to win. Because that's another, like we've been taught that it's impossible to win. And we need to reassess what winning means. Winning... Mm-hmm. And I often tell, I used to say this to the kids that I used to work with, Harriet Tubman wasn't out here burning fields and plantations of the capitalists and saving people so that you could have a seat at the master's table. That was yeah. not, you had to burn that damn house down too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right? Just passing the torch to you. You have literally. to, you, literally you yeah. have to, like, because ultimately is the very foundation of it all that is just, rotten to the Mm -hmm. core and so we should have the pride the confidence the courage the boldness Mm. to want it all because we built it all yeah yes (laughs) i was thinking Uh, about the phrase um you don't hate mondays you hate capitalism Mm, right and um it's so important (laughs) because it's like there's coming back to this like knowing what your enemy is you know it's not the people it is the system, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Like when you mentioned about Cuba and healthcare, and I thought about the experience of being in this country and 
how healthcare, how the capitalists have transformed healthcare, that there's all these doctors who went into this field because they want to save people's lives. And now they have them working as if they're on an assembly line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You come in, you get 15 minutes, if that, to talk to a doctor. And it's immediately, what's your insurance? What's this? What's that? Mm-hmm. And it's just like very, very quick. They don't even look at you. They're just like on the computer writing down the notes, right? And how is it that you get your health care? Well, the insurance company ultimately decides, mm-hmm. like, is this, a pro- is this something that you should, you know, get or not? Not the doctor, not the person. Like the relationship that people have with their doctors has been transformed by capitalism Mm -hmm. to the misery and the needless suffering of millions of people. And it's this industry. Mm -hmm. It's that they've turned everything into a profit-making machine. That's not natural. That doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be. We can get rid of the middleman. Mm-hmm. And in this case, all of those insurance companies are the middleman. Mm-hmm. They are what is standing between us and our health care. And they put our doctors through it, they put our nurses through it, and they put us through it, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, it's only been the fact that there have been struggles with the, with the unions of these medical workers to be able to push back. And when those struggles have combined with the communities whose health, whose hospitals are about to be closed, those become an even greater force. But even still, it has to become a national force yeah. because this is how they break us one by one and locally in individual spaces mm-hmm. is how they're able to take over the things that are ours. Right. Our health care is ours. And they're making millions of dollars by preventing us from getting the care that we need at the moment we need it the most. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is legal under capitalism. That's why we have to go beyond a critique of a few corporations or a few CEOs or a few bad apples and understand Mm -hmm. that the system itself is producing these problems that are not unsolvable. But we actually have to break free from this paradigm Mm -hmm. and actually have to take back what is ours. Cut out the middleman. People deserve health care. They should be able to go to the doctor and get the care that they need. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be some parasite who's making money when you're sick off of you being sick and off of depriving you from getting the medicine that you need or the procedure that you need. Mm -hmm. That's not an inevitable natural outcome. It's capitalism. Right. Right. Wow. This is, I'm learning, I'm just digesting a lot from everything that you all are saying and I'm I'm just so ready. I'm just so ready to (laughs) to fight. I'm so ready to invite everyone in my life into, you know, into, into the fight um 2024 is going to be a big year. So um I don't know, I want to hear any any last any last comments on 2024. I mean, skin in the game. I think is a historic moment. Mm-hmm. It's a historic moment because there's a lot of shifts that are happening mm-hmm. um economically, politically, yeah. in all ways and at all levels, domestically, internationally. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a wave of progressiveness. There's a wave of anti-colonial struggles Mm. um, all across, all Mm -hmm. across the globe. And we need to look at that. uh, And we need to learn from that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, there are two realities in this country. There's a reality of those who own everything. And there's a reality of the majority who own nothing. You know, and it's a question of power. And what we do at this moment is is critical mm-hmm. for many generations to come. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about the elections, right? Actually, it goes beyond the elections. Mm-hmm. It is whether we have the capacity to commit ourselves to transformation and to projects that are there to give and sustain life or whether we are going to continue to legitimize death destruction via capitalism. Mm. Like, that's the decisiveness of this moment. Yep. And I feel like we need to be able to understand what is at stake. And that we can, if we don't choose correctly, digress many decades mm-hmm. back. And we need to be ready for whatever the outcomes of 2024 will be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to build community. This is a moment for that. We need to be able to 
organize in our communities. We need to be able to deepen the consciousness of our people in our communities. Mm. And again, this goes beyond 2024. I think it's a good moment to intervene. But understanding that it is a long fight, is a long march, and we need to be really, really committed to the transformation of society from its very root. Mm. Um, and understand, you know, the challenges, the obstacles, but also the beauty that comes with that. And I would say, too, that the political program is crucial. That's the thing that is, like, cut off immediately from all of these important struggles that are taking place from all the nonprofits, like, all these different struggles that people are involved in around housing, around education, around everything. There's no shortage of people who give to their communities, that keep people alive, whether that's mutual aid. There's millions of people who do it. Mm -hmm. People who become teachers, right? They know that this is not going to be a job where they're going to become millionaires, but they do it. So there's all of this potential and there's all of this creativity that exists in our communities. The political part, though, mm -hmm. is what really matters to unify this, mm -hmm. right? So that it becomes an expression of what it is that we want. And it's very important. Now, I know that bourgeois politics is disgusting. The individualism, I can understand and I felt why I'm not interested in politics. I'm not political. That saying, I understand that because it's so gross. Bourgeois politics is gross. It's so individualistic. It's so vapid and shallow. Um, it's, it's disgusting. And so it's no wonder why people could think about politics and say, I don't want to be with that. But we have to conceive of politics differently, mm -hmm. right? A politics of liberation, mm -hmm. about power, that all of our struggles have to be connected and that we have to be going in a direction. And if we come out and we're not political or we're not going to have our, our stance, well, if you don't indoctrinate your people, someone else will, Yeah. right? And here comes Trump. Mm -hmm. If we don't talk to our people about the problems that they're having and provide solutions, then they're going to be presented with false solutions, mm -hmm. right? And that's what Trump is giving. But you can't defeat that with these Band-Aid, nothing solutions that the Democrats give. The mm -hmm. Democrats want to keep things the way that they are because they're fine with it. We actually need transformative change. We need to expand democracy. We're not going to expand democracy with these billionaires in power. We're not. So that's what socialism is. That's what we need to talk about with people. And we can't be afraid to talk about it because mm -hmm. this is our future and we have every right to talk about socialism and every single issue that's affecting our communities. Yeah, amazing. Well, I think that's a great, amazing note to end on that <laughs> this, this campaign is just a start. This campaign is just a start. We're building a bridge to, to socialism, to socialist consciousness. Thank you so much, Claudia Karina, for being in conversation, for just breaking it down, for sharing your personal journeys. I learned a lot from being in conversation. Um, I take away from this a deepening commitment to to growing socialist consciousness in uh, in my community, uh, in within you know all the organizations, um, and within my lifetime. I want to see socialism. So that's what this is about, and. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.